You are listening to The Standard Podcast, 2018 edition. This week's headlines include Scugog approves operating budget, satellites a proposed solution for rural internet problems in Uxbridge, Lori Scott recognizes Kawartha Lake's female leaders, big impact from Big Brothers Big Sisters in Kawartha Lake's Halliburton, and in sports, Mojacks fall behind in Or Division finals, and local teen conquers Ultimate Army Cadet Challenge in Chile. Skugog approves operating budget. Dan Kearns, Skugog. Skugog residents will be seeing a $55 increase on their combined tax bill this year. At a meeting on Monday, March 5th, Skugog Council approved the 2018 municipal operating budget in the amount of $12,272,100, which includes a 3.86% tax increase. Council's original target was a 3.9% increase, but staff were able to bring that down to 3.86%. Treasurer Diane Valencham described it as a responsible budget. As well, according to the treasurer, $416,000 in savings was found through the township's core service and efficiency review. To put the budget in perspective, when combined with the region and education taxes, homeowners in Scugog with a residence valued at $398,200 will see a $55 increase, a 1.25% increase on the total residential tax bill. Mayor Tom Rowett said, Road work is a main priority in the 2018 budget, and said based on the comments he has had from residents, this budget has been well received. I believe we are doing what our constituents have asked us to do, Mayor Rowett said. I'm very happy to be handing it over to the next term of council, with the processes that have been adopted in place and the staff that's in place. Satellites, a proposed solution for rural internet problems in Uxbridge. Christopher Green, Uxbridge. MP Jennifer O'Connell for the Pickering-Uxbridge riding made a presentation to Uxbridge Council on March 5th. During her presentation, she touched on an issue close to home for many rural Uxbridge residents, better internet access. Broadband is a very local issue, said MP O'Connell, pointing towards an issue with a document she hoped to present to Council about the Colonel Sam Sharp statue. She said, One of the reasons I couldn't print out that Sam Sharp letter today was, I went to my office to print it, and we have no internet working right now. Her admission that rural internet problems affect her, too, was met with empathetic laughter from Council, who could relate to the issue. In Budget 2018, there's an investment of $100 million over five years for low-Earth orbit satellites, she said. That was specifically added for rural communities. The idea is that, perhaps, the low-Earth orbit satellites might be a more cost-effective, faster way to get some internet to rural areas where laying high-speed lines might be a little more tricky, or costly, depending on the location. The federal budget states, Low-Earth orbit, LEO, satellites, situated closer to the surface of the Earth than traditional high-orbit satellites, can receive and transmit data with significantly improved response times, speeding up data services while maintaining the benefits of satellite technology, including the ability to provide internet across challenging landscapes at much lower costs than fiber-optic technology. Canada is also uniquely placed with space satellite industry leaders to build and operate LEO satellite technologies, creating jobs and market opportunities around the world. MP O'Connell assured Uxbridge Council she's been eager to see investment in rural internet. I went right up to Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development, Navdeep Singh Baines, right after the budget was announced and asked, what's there for broadband? And he quickly started listing off what was in the budget for that. She also added that she would keep Council informed about updates. On broadband, I'll provide you with more information as I receive it, because I know that's a major issue. Ms. O'Connell also reminded Council the Connect to Innovate initiative from the previous budget, directed at improving internet conditions, is still in place as well. Regarding this initiative, Ward 3 Councillor Dave Barton asked, How much funding has been announced? I know there's high speed for some Indigenous communities with the Connect to Innovate, and then some in Quebec as well, but I haven't heard much in Ontario yet. MP O'Connell responded, I don't think I've heard anything in Ontario. I could double-check. I believe I heard Newfoundland got some funding. I don't know the answer in terms of percentage. I'll take that back and see if we can get that detail. Council was quick to thank MP O'Connell for her efforts for Uxbridge and area. I want to thank you on behalf of Council for the work you do for Uxbridge, because it's very much appreciated, said Mayor Gary Lynn O'Connor. For more information on the federal budget, visit budget.gc.ca. If you have any questions for MP O'Connell, call 905-839-2878 or email jennifer.oconnell.cl at parl.gc.ca. That's J-E-N-N-I-F-F-E-R dot O-C-O-N-N-E-L dot C-L at P-A-R-L dot G-C dot C-A. Read it.
Lori Scott recognizes Kawartha Lakes female leaders. Dan Kearns, Kawartha Lakes. To celebrate International Women's Day, MPP Lori Scott recognized several female community members for their contributions to the local community at an event on Friday, March 9th. At the event, four women were named the recipients of the 2018 Leading Women, Leading Girls, Building Communities Awards. A press release from Ms. Scott's office read, The Leading Women, Leading Girls, Building Communities Recreation Program acknowledges women and girls who demonstrate exceptional leadership, inspire others through their devotion to community service, and are strong role models who encourage future generations to become involved in making their community a better place for everyone. The first person recognized was Evelyn Chambers, the president of the Lindsay Agricultural Society. Ms. Scott said to those in attendance, She's been instrumental in the agriculture industry, and with 4-H Ontario, and certainly breaking down lots of barriers and positions in agriculture that were mainly male-dominated. Ms. Chambers said she was humbled to receive this honor from MPP Scott. Penny Chatson and Bella Alderton from Women's Resources in Lindsay were also two of the recipients of the awards. Ms. Scott told the duo, Collectively, you've helped hundreds of women and girls, and you can't be thanked enough for that dedication. 4-H Ambassador Sadie Jean Hickson was also recognized with an award. Ms. Scott said, She's an award-winning athlete. She was an ambassador for 4-H Ontario, a cornerstone for youth involvement in the Oakwood community, and she's broken down many barriers on her own. Ms. Chambers also spoke highly of Ms. Hickson. She said, We're only seeing the beginning of Sadie Jane and the rest of the Hickson family. Big Impact from Big Brothers Big Sisters in Kawartha Lakes Halliburton. Christopher Green. Big Brothers Big Sisters, BBBS, of Kawartha Lakes and Halliburton provides mentoring programs to children and youth aged 6 to 16 years. Children are matched to screen and train volunteers once they are accepted into the program. The matches are then monitored by staff to ensure a strong relationship is developing and everyone feels safe and secure in the friendship. BBBS assists children with reaching their full potential. According to Kawartha Lakes Halliburton Chapter Executive Director Jim DeFlorio, children who have a mentor through BBBS are more likely to complete high school and attend post-secondary education. They are less likely to experiment with drugs and alcohol, are less likely to depend on social assistance, and will have better relationships with peers and family. The community has supported BBBS for the past 38 years through donations, attending fundraising events, volunteering in the various mentoring programs, or at fundraising events. Big Brothers Big Sisters receives United Way funding, but must raise the bulk of their operating revenue through fundraising events. One upcoming fundraiser is their annual spring dance, featuring the Enforcers, on April 21st at the Victoria Park Armory. Tickets are available in advance or at the door. They also have a big dinner and auction on Thursday, June 7th at the Victoria Park Armory. Tickets are only available in advance for this event. I take so much pride that I've had such a big influence in a person's life, Big Sister Renee said, speaking from personal experience with the program. Hannah, my little sister, is quickly growing to be one of my best friends, and I wouldn't dream of having this experience with any other little sister. A parent of a different mentored child also told her story. Since Lawrence has come into our lives, Spencer, my son, embraces change freely and tries new things. I am also so thankful that my son has been a part of the Big Brother program. It has helped him grow and learn vital skills for becoming a confident adult. If you would like to be involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters in Kawartha Lakes Halliburton, you can volunteer as a mentor, volunteer with their fundraising committee, become a board member, hold a third-party fundraiser with the approval of the organization, or make a donation to support mentoring programs. Interested individuals can call the office at 705-324-6800 for more information. They can also visit the website at www.bigbrothersbigsisters.info to learn more about Big Brothers Big Sisters of Kawartha Lakes Halliburton. Tech, tech, technical foul. North Durham Sports. Mojacks fall behind in or division finals. Dan Kearns, Skugog. The Port Perry Mojacks are facing elimination in the or division finals. The Mojacks are trailing the Lakefield Chiefs three games to one heading into a crucial Game 5 in Lakefield on Tuesday, March 13th, past the standards press deadline. After dropping the first game of the series 4-2 in Lakefield on Tuesday, March 6th, the Mojacks bounced back with a win on home ice a day later. The only goal in that game came almost three and a half minutes into the first period. On a Mojack power play, Graham Lammer scored what would later be the game winner. And the Mojacks won Game 2 by a score of 1-0, tying the series at one game each. However, the Mojacks were unable to get a win in Game 3 of the series on Friday, March 9th, in Lakefield. The Mojacks had a 2-0 lead after the first 20 minutes of play, thanks to goals from Brady Martin and Cody Fruner. Over 13 minutes into the second period, 
Mitch Gustafsson scored, expanding Port Perry's lead to 3-0. But three straight Lakefield goals in a span of about a minute and a half tie the game 3-3. With a bit over two minutes remaining in the second frame, Derek Risebro scored a power play goal, giving Port Perry their lead back. But that didn't last. Lakefield's Aaron Vatcher scored three times in the second period, and the Chiefs held on to beat the Mojacks 6-4. Port Perry looked to rebound from that loss in Game 4 on Sunday, March 11th at Skugug Arena. Almost 11 and a half minutes into the first period, Austin Mackey tipped a shot from Dan Harris into the Lakefield net for a power play goal, giving Port Perry a 1-0 lead. Then, with 47 seconds remaining in the period, Mitch Gustafson's shot found Twine, extending the Mojacks' lead to 2-0. However, the Chiefs scored twice in the second period, and the game was tied after 40 minutes of play. Just 18 seconds into the third frame, Lakefield scored, taking their first lead of the game 3-2. The Mojacks tied the game 11 minutes in, as Risebro fired a shot past Lakefield's goaltender. But over a minute later, the Chiefs put the puck past Mojacks goaltender Sean Mabley, and held on to beat Port Perry 4-3. After the game, Mojacks head coach Tom Boyle spoke about what the coaching staff's message to the team is, heading into a possible elimination game in Lakefield on Tuesday. He said, continue playing hard, the way they have been, and good things happen when you work hard. The message is to continue with the game plan and continue working hard. If the Mojacks win Game 5, Game 6 will be held on Friday, March 16th at 7.25pm at Skugog Arena. If necessary, Game 7 is scheduled for Saturday, March 17th in Lakefield. Local Teen Conquers Ultimate Army Cadet Challenge in Chile Leah Kinnear of Cannington, Ontario, spent 13 days backcountry trekking and kayaking the Pantagonia Mountains as part of the International Army Cadet Expedition to Chile. Lydia, a member of the 41 Royal Canadian Army Cadet Corps in Port Perry, Ontario, participated in two days of fitness testing and expedition preparation before heading to Chile, along with 18 other top Army cadets selected from across Canada. The expedition itself included a multi-day backcountry trekking experience, followed by sea kayaking and visiting the famous Penguin Island before returning to Canada. Hosted in 2018 around the Torres del Paine area of Chile, the International Army Cadet Expedition is an annual event designed for senior Army cadets ages 16 to 18. The expedition challenges cadets' core skills of leadership and teamwork in a unique outdoor setting that helps improve upon the skills introduced at their local Army Cadet Corps. Annually, 18 Army cadets from across the country are selected for the opportunity, which acts at the top level of the Army Cadet Expedition program. To be selected to attend, cadets must have achieved one of the highest levels of training at their Army Cadet Corps, participating in zone and regional expeditions, and have achieved a minimum of gold level in the Army Cadet Fitness Test. Lydia Kinnear said, I learned a lot in Chile. Every day presented many new challenges, and you really find out what you were made of. I was so happy to be with so many great cadets and leaders that helped push me, and Chile is an incredible country. Hello, I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen, and welcome to The Story Behind the Person. This week we're featuring Dr. Jack Cottrell, making a difference one tooth at a time. Life offers us many opportunities, and most people try and take advantage of those that come their way. There are very few individuals who use those opportunities for the betterment of others. One of those people is our very own Jack Cottrell. Dr. Jack runs a very successful dental practice in town and has for the past 40 years. There are few folks in our township who do not know of him. But more importantly, there are at least 60,000 people in third world countries who have had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Jack Cottrell. Jack, the son of a Welsh immigrant father and a Torontonian mother, was born in Toronto and quickly realized the prospects of a solid education. My mother worked hard all her life, Jack explained. When she had an opportunity to further her education, she took it. He paused a moment. The year she turned 65, she graduated from the University of Toronto with a Bachelor of Arts degree, something she'd always wanted. I saw the pride and respect in his eyes as he spoke. Jack had always been fond of Port Perry, and when he graduated from dental college, decided to move here. He still practices in the same building on Queen Street where he started. From a professional standpoint, uh, it's really a, a community where your patients are part of your extended family, and it's something that uh, I feel strongly about that, and, and uh, that's the way I treat my patients as friends, as family, and, uh, and they respond. And uh, there is no better trusting relationship than what you get uh, when, when you're able to achieve that uh, uh, with people. So, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, when I say best-kept secret, uh, 
uh, you know, we do have all of the amenities uh, that a community could ever want, uh, an excellent public library, uh, a hospital that is really second to none, and uh, uh, again, all the sports facilities too to raise a young family with all this with the, within a close proximity to Toronto. So, yes, uh, it's, uh, please, it's, it is a, a, the best kept secret, and uh, <laughs> I hope it stays like that. <laughs> Twelve years ago, Jack developed a strategy in an effort to assist people in less half countries. Together with physician Tony Brown, they recruited eight to ten healthcare professionals and traveled to countries such as Guatemala, El Salvador, and Haiti to assess the opportunity of helping people in need. The project became very successful, and the group, made up of healthcare professionals from across Canada, regularly travels to these nations to give first class medical care. It needs to be noted, this is all done at the expense of each caregiver. Airfare, accommodation, meals, and medical supplies, not to mention their service. Jack explained about a community of 200,000 in crime-infested El Salvador, where there was absolutely no medical facility or service. We treated the people, and the gratitude visible on their faces was emotionally satisfying, Jack explained. Treating children who had been crying themselves to sleep due to pain and then seeing them pain-free and happy is a wonderful gift. The conditions are obviously very primitive many times, and uh, and maybe is this isn't the type of thing for everyone, but uh, there is such a feeling, uh, uh, almost a spiritual feeling, when you can see not just a few people, but thousands of people with profound need, and be able to go into those communities and help them. And sometimes, most times, it's life-changing uh, uh, things that you are doing for them, things that they could never afford to do on their own, but you're able to provide it at no cost to them and be able to move forward. So it's really, uh, it's it's kind of a, a people-centered approach to peace, if you will, if you will because, uh, you know, we talk about all the strife in the world, but uh, people that you've helped in that way will, will never ever think anything but really good things about uh, about you and about the the country that you've come from. So it is uh, we get as much out of uh, working uh, down in these environments than the people that we actually help. Jack, Tony, and the team decided to take the project one step further and began a fundraising campaign to build and staff a medical facility in that village. They raised the funds, and now a physician and dentist work there on a regular basis. Operating a busy practice, as well as going on medical mission trips, would be enough for most people. But for Jack Cottrell, it only scratches the surface. Jack has always been a supporter of universal standards in dentistry, and in 1997 was elected president of the Ontario Dental Association. In 2005, Jack went national and became president of the Canadian Dental Association. Six years later, in 2011, he joined the board of the FDI, the World Dental Federation, a group which serves as the principal representative body for more than one million dentists worldwide. Four years later, Jack was asked to become treasurer of the organization, the second highest level attainable. In his role, Jack helps lead the organization in developing health policies, continuing education programs, speaking as a unified voice for dentistry and international advocacy, and supporting member associations in global oral health promotion activities. It is so important to ensure every dentist in every country has access to the latest technology products and techniques, Jack said. We constantly strive to raise the bar so we can bring a higher level of health care to the global population. The organization, the oldest of its kind in the world, as it was started in Paris in 1900, is now based in Zurich, the world center for many organizations of this type. They have an extremely close working relationship with the World Health Organization and have become a very important conduit of the WHO. I asked Jack if he enjoyed the traveling, and to my surprise, he said he's always anxious to get back to his practice. He seldom tax vacation onto any of his trips, and when he visits Zurich every three months, he flies out on Wednesday nights and makes sure he's back in his office Monday mornings. His staff of 31 adheres to the office policy of delivering a very high level of value to patients. You're only as good as your lowest common denominator, Jack clarified, and the level of quality in their office is visibly high. It's no wonder Port Perry Dental Center has been selected Best Dental Office by the Reader's Choice Awards every year since the honor's inception in 1999.
Twenty years ago, Jack in the Office began an emergency service available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This fantastic contribution to the community assists many people who need emergency treatment after most offices are closed. Dr. Jack Cottrell is an asset to our community. More than that, through his generosity both in time and commitment, he is an asset to dental care around the world. I don't know how he fits everything into his busy schedule, but for all of us in this community, we're glad he does. For more information on the charity Sparrowway and how you can make a difference, visit Sparrowway.com. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen, and this has been the story behind the person. This podcast has been presented with permission from the Standard Newspaper Group. For more information, visit jonathanvanbilson.com. Music for this podcast is by Natasha Green of Greenstream Studio. For more information, visit greenstreamstudio.ca. For more local news, visit www.thestandardnewspaper.ca. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio. Visit www.greenstreamstudio.ca for all your multimedia production needs. Do you have audio production needs? Greenstream Studio is here for you. But don't just take our word for it. Let's listen to these testimonials. Chris is hardworking, trustworthy, and on top of that, he has a great ear for audio. His audio editing and sound design skills are very high quality. He has always conducted himself with very much professionalism. He would be an asset to any organization requiring these expertise and attention to detail. For more information, visit greenstreamstudio.ca.